Welcome to Value-Based Care, Regulatory Environment. This is Lecture B. In this lecture, we will discuss the main provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA, or Obamacare. The objectives for this lecture, the Affordable Care Act, are to describe the coverage expansions and delivery system reforms included in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Describe the National Quality Strategy. On March 23, 2010, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act into law. You are likely familiar with the insurance provisions associated with the law, and we will address these provisions briefly in the next slide. But there are other components as well, including an emphasis on quality and health system performance and controlling health care costs. The next slide includes a brief overview of the insurance changes, and the remaining parts of the lecture will address delivery system reforms. There are also provisions that focus on public programs to enhance prevention and wellness within populations, with an emphasis on supporting long-term care programs and addressing workforce needs. A nice summary of the ACA was developed by the Kaiser Family Foundation and can be found on their website, kff.org. This slide developed by the Kaiser Family Foundation does a nice job at illustrating how the ACA expands insurance coverage. The health reform law seeks to expand health coverage by building on the existing public-private system for providing health insurance and filling in the gaps in the current system. For states that choose to participate, the law expands eligibility for the Medicaid program, the current safety net health insurance program for the poor. It creates new exchanges or marketplaces, where people can purchase coverage and, depending on their income, receive premium subsidies to help them pay for the coverage. It includes new penalties for employers that don't offer coverage to their employees and provides tax credits to small employers that do, in order to bolster the availability of employer-sponsored coverage. Supporting these enhanced coverage mechanisms is a new requirement that individuals, with some exceptions, have health insurance, referred to as the individual mandate, and new rules for insurers requiring them to provide coverage to everyone regardless of health status and limiting the variations in premiums they charge people. Together, these strategies are designed to increase significantly the number of people with health insurance. Changes to the way health care is delivered and paid for are aimed at improving efficiency, cost containment, and improved quality of care. These reforms center on the development of new organizational models of care. These new models of care are designed to shift the focus of reimbursement away from volume, which is a characteristic of the fee-for-service model, to one that is focused on value. These new models of care aim to reduce some of the fragmentation in care delivery. Most of these delivery system reforms pertain to the Medicare program, since this program is controlled and paid for by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. The next series of slides will briefly describe these new organizational models. There are also provisions that speak specifically to payment reforms to encourage higher quality of care. In addition, the ACA provides resources to support system-wide improvements. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was established to test new payment and service delivery approaches that will reduce expenditures and improve the quality of care for Medicare, Medicaid, and Children's Health Insurance Program beneficiaries. The Innovation Center's website indicates that demonstrations of new payment and service delivery approaches are now occurring in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. The Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute PICORI, funds research that focuses on improvement in quality of life, functioning, and long-term survival among patients. PICORI seeks to improve the information available to patients, caregivers, clinicians, and insurers when making health-related decisions. The Medicare-Medicaid Coordination Office, as the name implies, seeks to improve coordination between Medicare and Medicaid. Both Medicare and Medicaid provide health insurance coverage for low-income elderly individuals, known as the DUALS. 
This office launches demonstrations designed to integrate the care provided by these two payer sources. Demonstrations are focused on two initiatives, one designed to reduce avoidable hospitalizations and another to align the financing of Medicare and Medicaid-covered services. Accountable care organizations are groups of providers, doctors, hospitals, and others, who agree to take responsibility for the quality of care and cost of care for a defined population of patients. The ACA established the Medicare Shared Savings Program in order to encourage development of Medicare ACOs. If an ACO met certain quality benchmarks and was able to keep spending within a targeted amount, that is, if they generated savings, then that ACO would receive 50% of those savings. In 2015, there were 400 ACOs serving about 14% of the Medicare population, or 7.2 million beneficiaries. So far, the success of ACOs in improving quality and in cost containment is somewhat mixed. For example, in 2013, among the 220 ACOs in existence that year, only 52% met the quality benchmarks while keeping spending below the budgeted targets. The ACA seeks to change the way in which primary care is delivered. The focus is on developing patient-centered medical homes that emphasize comprehensive care coordination, care teams, patient engagement, and population health management. The ACA supports programs and initiatives that work to transform primary care to the medical home model, as well as integrate primary care with other services, such as behavioral health and long-term care. The Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative Program is a four-year multi-payer demonstration program to promote better access, care coordination, chronic disease management, and patient caregiver engagement. Participating physician practices are provided with enhanced $20 per member per month reimbursements from commercial and state health insurance plans, as well as technical assistance and data on practice performance. An evaluation of the program shows that between October 2012 and September 2013, the practices generated sufficient savings to cover most, but not all, of the enhanced fee. Emergency department visits decreased by about 3%, and hospital readmissions by 1%. The multi-payer advanced primary care practice demonstration involves multiple payers that include Medicare, private insurers, and Medicaid to test the impact of providing a per-member, per-month fee to primary care sites for providing medical home services. Evaluation results estimate savings around $4.2 million for every dollar paid by Medicare. The Federally Qualified Health Center Advanced Primary Care Practice Demonstration provides a $6 per member per month fee for each Medicare beneficiary served by community health centers for three years. The additional payment was to encourage FQHCs to become recognized as National Committee for Quality Assurance recognized patient-centered medical homes. 73% of the participating FQHCs became recognized, but this was short of the targeted 90% goal. CMS supports the Independence at Home demonstration, where medical practices deliver comprehensive primary care services in the homes of high-need Medicare beneficiaries. Health homes target low-income patients with complex health needs. States demonstrate certain providers as health homes where physical and behavioral health services are integrated. Medicare payment reforms focus on adopting effective delivery and, in some instances, reducing adverse medical events such as hospital-acquired infections and repeat admissions. The Commonwealth Fund report reference on this slide contains a nice appendix that summarizes some of these payment reforms. The Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program reduces Medicare payments to hospitals with excess readmissions for certain conditions, such as acute myocardial infarction or pneumonia. A hospital is considered to have excess readmissions if their readmissions exceed the national average. In fiscal year 2015, 2,610 hospitals faced a penalty associated with excess readmissions, with 39 hospitals receiving the maximum reduction of 3% for payments associated with every Medicare stay. 
The hospital-acquired conditions reduction program reduces Medicare payments to hospitals that have the highest number of such infections based on data collected two years prior. Under the Hospital Value-Based Purchasing Program, hospitals can receive a Medicare incentive payment if they meet certain quality and cost performance standards. The Physician Value-Based Purchasing Program will adjust Medicare payments to physicians based on cost and quality of care. This program is currently implemented for practices comprised of 100-plus physicians on a voluntary basis who are not in ACOs or the Primary Care Transformation Project. In 2015, physician payment adjustments for groups participating in the program ranged from a 1% decrease in payment to about a 5% increase. The Bundled Care Payments Program provides a single payment for hospital, physician, and post-acute services related to a defined episode of care occurring within the Medicare program. By bundling payments, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services aims to provide more coordinated care and lower costs. We have been discussing payment and delivery systems reforms occurring at the national level through the Medicare program. Similar reforms also occur in the states through the Medicaid program. Since each state can modify the Medicaid program individually within guidelines articulated by the federal government, not all states have implemented the same types of reforms and reforms can look very different across the states. Nevertheless, reforms can be grouped into broad categories that tend to mirror the reforms occurring at the national level. Patient-centered medical homes within Medicaid programs, the Medicaid agency, for example the state, or a managed care company that has a contract with the state, pays providers that perform PCMH functions a per-member, per-month fee in addition to the usual fee for services payments for each Medicaid beneficiary. Accountable care organizations, which we discussed briefly, are essentially groups of providers that have agreed to accept responsibility for the provision of care for a defined population. Some states are pursuing ACOs for their Medicaid population and building on existing systems such as PCMHs. Health homes are defined in the ACA and are aimed at Medicaid beneficiaries with multiple chronic conditions, including mental illness. Medicaid health homes must provide the following services. Comprehensive care management, care coordination and health promotion, transitional care, referrals to community and social services, patient and family support, and use of health information technology. States with health homes receive additional funding from the federal government for those beneficiaries. The movement to manage care within Medicaid programs has been occurring over a number of years and predates the passage of the ACA. Only a few states, Alaska, Wyoming, and Connecticut, have not implemented managed care into their Medicaid programs. There are a variety of managed care models within Medicaid programs. But generally, the idea is to pay health plans or providers a capitated case management fee for the management of each individual in the program. Under the Primary Care Case Management Program model, states contract with providers and pay them a capitated amount to manage the care of defined sets of patients. Providers are also reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis for actual services provided. In risk-based managed care contracts, the state contracts with the managed care health plan. Plans are paid a capitated amount for beneficiaries. If spending for a beneficiary is greater than the capitated amount, then the health plan is at risk for the excess cost. If spending is lower, the plan can keep the savings. More recently, states have applied for waivers to allow them to undertake initiatives expected to save Medicaid expenditures. Savings are then to be used for new investments in delivery system reform. Under this program, called Delivery System Reform Incentive Program, DSRIP waivers, hospitals and other providers can receive funds if they meet certain criteria and performance metrics. We previously discussed the National Quality Strategy, which was mandated by the Affordable Care Act, and pointed out the three aims for the NQS, better care, healthy people and communities, and affordable care. 
If you recall, we discussed how the aims are operationalized through several priorities and levers. Levers represent the tools or mechanisms by which organizations can work to improve healthcare quality. The NQS sets a framework to ensure that federal health programs are redesigned to improve healthcare quality, that the delivery system in general is engaged in quality improvement reforms, and that we have robust measurement of care processes and outcomes. In the previous slides on payment and organizational reforms, we noted specific programs mandated by the ACA aimed at improving the quality of care provided to Medicare beneficiaries. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services also set a goal of moving 30% of Medicare provider payments to occur in alternative payment models, such as the accountable care organizations or bundled payments, by the end of 2016, and 50% by the end of 2018. Similarly, by 2016, the aim was to have 85% of all Medicare fee-for-service payments tied to quality or value through the Physician Value-Based Payment Program. The impact of the National Quality Strategy is monitored by data included in the National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report. The 2014 report documents some success so far with regard to the NQS priorities. However, it is important to note that areas for improvement remain. This chart shows the number and percent of quality measures tied to the NQS and whether the measure has improved, remained the same, or worsened between 2001-2002 and 2012. Numbers in the box represent the number of measures in each category. For example, among a total of 168 measures captured, 102 measures are improving, about 60%. 55 measures show no change, and 11 are getting worse. One area of success has to do with the rates of hospital-acquired conditions. These are adverse events such as infections acquired in the hospital. As this graph highlights, the rates of hospital-acquired conditions have decreased between 2010 and 2013. A key concern among policymakers had to do with the number of people returning to the hospital within 30 days of admission. Some of the new payment strategies directly targeted or penalized institutions if they had an excessive number of repeat 30-day readmissions. The new payment and organizational reforms likely contributed to reductions in all-cause 30-day hospital readmission rates. This concludes Lecture B of Regulatory Environment. In this lecture, we highlighted how the Affordable Care Act is spearheading reforms to the U.S. healthcare delivery system. These reforms focus on both the way healthcare is delivered and how care is paid for. The intent of the reforms is to improve healthcare quality and reducing cost by moving payments away from volume based reimbursement towards value based reimbursement while emphasizing care coordination. Early evidence seems to indicate that these reforms and system transformation initiatives are resulting in better quality of care.